Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to the Masterclass Theatre. Last day of the National Home Building Show. Today, I am Alex, Alexander Thompson. I'm an architect, as you can see from my back. And I've got about 15 years experience of building houses, extensions, lofts, basement rooms, all sorts of things. And today, I'm just going to talk for 20 minutes about some of the things to avoid. Now, I think it's going to be a little bit more than 10, but if I go slowly, maybe it'll be 15 or 20. So, if we try and summarize some of the things, you know, we're going to try and reduce the stress. Very stressful building these projects. Uh, how to work on a good design brief. And building plans. You know, there are lots of different types of building plans. There are planning, planning drawings, there are building regulation drawings. And we're going to look at the cost accuracy. So if, you, if I have this type of drawing and I give it to a builder, what sort of price can I expect to get? Underestimation is another subject that we'll look at. It's to do with lead-ins and how long does it take to order things? How long can I expect my program to take? Design, the devaluing of my capital asset. Uh, the idea generally is to extend my house it's to build a new bedroom. And in this way, I'm going to increase the value of my building. We're going to look at some of the ways that you can actually decrease the value. Uh, builders' contracts and potentially being held to ransom. It's a, it's a, a, a difficult one. It's uh, everybody, or not everybody, but many people that have built before will say, never again. I will never build again. And it takes them two or three years to recover. And they think, yes, I shall get a professional to help me next time. And part of that reason is because they've changed their mind a lot and the builder has been a little unscrupulous perhaps. Now hopefully by the end we'll have five minutes or so to, to have some questions. So limiting the stress. Making decisions early and trying not to change your mind. It's the most common thing. The idea of having a set of plans is that you put all your ideas into one document and have a scope of work, and that is what the builder goes and builds. The theory is, is that he can then build it and you don't have to make any decisions during the progress of the work. So, item two, planning makes perfect. With some of the other lectures that are going on in the bigger theatre down there, I've, I've seen that writing things down and taking minutes each time you meet your builder some of our best customers have taken detailed notes. Such and such a meeting, such and such a time, and these are all the things that were agreed. Any changes, you can write them down. And then a month later, or whatever it is, the builder says, oh, well, you didn't tell me that. You can say, yes, I did, on the 15th, on a Wednesday afternoon. Allow enough time for planning design. Many people think, well, I can get planning permission in eight weeks because they've called the council. It's not eight weeks. It's about three months, four, four or five weeks to, to, uh, to validate a project, and, and then eight weeks thereafter. The, all these phases, they take plenty of time. In a typical rear extension, you should allow about six months in planning time. And by giving yourself a reasonable program length, it just calmly rushing the project can add to the stress. I don't know if any of you ever lived on a building site, but I have, and uh, it's not much fun. It's quite dusty, and if you're trying to put a tie on to go to the office, it's, uh, it's difficult when uh, you have to brush the dust off. And one time I was living on a building site, and the builders turned up, and I don't know, they had a key, and there I was having a bath, and they're fixing the tiles, and, and, and there's no door, and uh, it's a bit embarrassing. So <laughs> avoid living on the building site. Design brief. It's one of those things right at the beginning. If you've got an architect or you've got a, a, a design consultant, then you're working on the design brief straight at the beginning. So setting the priorities. I want to achieve a new bedroom. I want to achieve a basement. I want to achieve a rear extension. I want to create a better living and dining space with a, a, a new kitchen. These are, these are your priorities. The wish list, alternatively, is all of the things that would be nice to have if I have that budget. So at the beginning, I always encourage a wish list. The wish list might have, say, 15 or 20 items on it, say 30 items. Five of those are priority items. 
six or f another five are, are, are the important and, and to do, and then the rest are if I can afford it. So your wish list priorities. Focusing on the program, um, we look at program, I've talked about it just a little bit already, but if you're going to manage the sub-trades, then uh, to try and reduce your cost. Just increase the length of the program a little bit so that you, you, you don't try and cram everything. Uh, uh, maybe a main contractor would take, say, three months to build the rear extension to put your kitchen in. You maybe add another month for some unforeseen errors. But then if you're managing the electrician, the plasterer, the flooring specialist, the sliding door specialist yourself, then instead of it being three months with a main contractor, allow maybe five months for you to manage that project, maybe six months. Again, reducing the stress. So, realistic budget and planning goals. Planning goals we talked about a little bit already. Researching the market, well, you know, who am I selling to perhaps in the end? Who's the house going to be for when I finish with it in five years' time? Uh, the realistic budget, um, we will talk about the, the, the uh, a bit, little bit more detail in that in a minute, but it's that, that is to do with contingency. Uh, and uh, if you've priced a job and the builder says initially, well, it's 25,000 or 45,000, then take 20 or 30% of that and then have that as a, as a contingency later. And, and expect to spend it, you know? It's uh, possible mistakes and bits and pieces. So building a bad design. So often I go to to houses that have maybe had some extensions, you know, in the 70s, another one in the 80s, little bits and pieces added here and there, and you can go in and it's like a little rabbit warren. I was doing a talk, it was a one minute uh, chit chat to about 30 people the other day, and I held up my child, my daughter's rabbit, and I said, does anybody know anybody who has a house like a rabbit warren? It's those little extensions all bolted onto the back of the building. This is where uh, too many little extensions, that is bad design, or, or, a, or a wonky, uh, <laughs> poorly formed dormer on the top of your roof. These things actually devalue the, the, the building. And so, you know, we encourage slightly larger pieces of steel to create that nice, big, open-plan room at the end of the building. Clearly, we're getting a lot of inspiration from the television these days. Lots of advice from magazines. And uh, we can all see it all today. Once you've got those photos, bring them to the architect, show them to the builder, this is the room that I want to create. Very useful to draw upon, uh, uh, you know, I sometimes we're getting presented little interior projects and the customer wants to pay 70,000 pounds on their two bed flat, and they turn up with like 40 photographs. Too much information. You know, try and hone it down to like two or three photos for each room and then that's, it, that's enough. Buying good quality drawings, that's like good quality design. If I hire the best designer, then in theory I'm going to increase the value of my building just through useful design. So in theory, your, your architects and interior designers, even if you only have, say, 10 hours of advice, they're going to help you with that. Trying to design a house yourself, unless you have specific training in the subject, is maybe a, a little ambitious, you know, and just spend a little time with, with someone to, to, to help you and point you in the right direction. Solar gain, I love this one. Uh, many people are building lofts. They always think about heat loss from a building. This, this idea is, is that, you know, it's on the top of the building, your loft is going to gain heat. Wherever, you know, you, you're gonna to point to the sun in some direction, so not only should it be heat loss that you're thinking about, but try and think about solar gain, because things heat up, and try and design out that problem.